Good morning. How you doing? Good. Yeah. Good. 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 Man, I. It was a good thing Brandon didn't let me talk a couple of weeks ago because I would have been a hot mess. Um, but uh, I am so honored to be among you guys. Um, I cannot express uh, what it means to be entrusted with the holy calling of being an elder and a pastor of this house. Uh, this is a, a dream that has been in my heart for many years. Uh, and what makes it even better is um, just the family that God has given me along the way. You guys have, have loved me and my family so well since we came here more than five years ago. It all started with, uh, with my best friend, Brandon Leon. So uh, he invited us to come to The Rock, and Amy and I, we were, we were praying about where we would plant ourselves uh, in that season. And if you know Brandon Leon, you know he's a very persuasive person. Okay. <laughs> And so what Amy and I decided to do is we said, you know what, we're going to go, but we're going to go to a service that we know Brandon's not going to be at. <laughs> and so we come to an early, I think a nine o'clock service back then. So it was an early Sunday morning service. We knew Brandon wasn't going to be here. And, uh, and so we show up and service was amazing. But then at the end of the service, Brandon Naramore walks on stage. And I'm like, what the heck, that's Brandon. All right, and Brandon and I, we went to Bible college. It had been about 10 years since we had seen each other. And so he gets off the stage and, and uh, go up to him, and we have a good conversation. And we just picked up from where we left off. And uh, man, I would say the last five and a half years, Brandon, um, the way you've um, just come alongside me and Amy, um, man, he has walked us through uh, so much healing and restoration. Um, you know, you've taken an interest in my personal life my spiritual life, the calling of God on my life. I don't know if you guys know this, but Brandon sent me to many preaching schools. <laughs> it's like, you're called to this, you're going, you're going. And uh, even we had a critical conversation a couple years ago where we were on the phone. And I told him, I'm, I, I'm done, I'm quitting. I'm not preaching anymore. Do you remember that? I, I was like, I'm, I'm done preaching. I'm just gonna pour my life into my work and into my family. And it was just this critical conversation that moment. It was one of those, you know, I wish you would step back from that ledge, my friend. It was like <laughs> critical, critical conversation, critical conversation. Um, and so, man, I, I just, I just want to tell you, I love you. Thank you uh, for believing in me, um, for believing in, in the Pattersons. Uh, it really means a lot. And so, man, yeah, yeah. So to be able to do this with, to be able to do this, this is what I'm trying to say, to be able to do this with my best friends, because I have a lot of people to thank, and I could be here all morning uh, talking to many of you guys about what you mean to me. Um, but I would not be here if it wasn't for Brandon Aramore, Brandon Leon. So uh, having best friends to do this with, having a family like you guys uh, to do this with means everything. You know, if you know me, you know I have zero desire to be famous. Like, I have, I have literally no ambition for a viral moment. Not, I don't want any of that. I really don't, right? But if I can know and love and be known and loved by those of you that are in this room, I will be as wealthy and famous as I ever hope to be. I really will. I will. You know? Okay? So. And so, um, as Brandon and I, we begin to have this conversation about uh, me uh, walking into this position. Uh, you know, let this be an encouragement to you because, you know, sometimes promotion just looks like outlasting everybody. You know, Pastor Francis retired, Pastor Bob retired, and I was just sitting here, right? Uh, you know, but as we started to have this conversation, um, I, I noticed that when Amy and I said yes, that a lot of things started to ramp up for us. Um, as we said yes, we noticed... Um, that, that something began to shift in the spirit, right? You've heard it, new levels, new devils, right? Uh, and, and over that time, last few, few months, um, we have began to experience an opposition that really still to this day has not relented, right? It has been a, a clear-cut opposition. And it's one thing, you know, for me to be attacked personally. Like, I get that, I'm used to that. Uh, but the way that the enemy has gone after my wife and my kids over the last couple months has been unreal, like the attack on my wife's body, the attack on my girl's spiritual life has been ruthless. And so that has led me to the text that I'm going to share with you today. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 
Am I, am I loud and echoey to you guys? Am I okay? So I just feel that way to me. Okay. <laughs> All right. First Samuel chapter 30. All right. And I want to talk to you about a place called Ziklag. It's a place called Ziklag. Now, all throughout scripture, in times of transition, just before the fulfillment of prophesied promises, the, the enemy often brings a counter move. Uh, he, designed, he designs a, a sort of Ziklag for God's people. He seeks to wear us out, to wear us down, to turn us back. Uh, John 10.10 10 says, the enemy only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to, 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 to make us believe that we are forsaken by God and that we do not have what it takes to finish the journey. He wants us to believe that the promises of God will never come to pass. And so what we're going to see is that Ziklag was this, uh, this make or break place for David. Uh, that that uh, David in Ziklag had one of the most devastating defeats of his life. But then straight away, it became possibly the greatest victory of his life. And so the way that David responded to Ziklag, uh, it, it basically took this crisis and it gave way to his crown. I want to show you guys that. And so as we study this passage together, as we look at this today, I want you to think about this question in your mind. All right, so think about this as we, we study this. Um, that what if the thing you want most, what if the fulfillment of God's promise to you was on the backside of your biggest trial. Think about that. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that you are here. You are here. Hmm. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We thank you that there is no greater name than Jesus. No other name under heaven by which man can be saved. And so, God, as we, as we talk about Ziklag, as we talk about uh, seasons of suffering, of hardship, of trial, God, help us to see. Help us to see exactly what you're doing. Lord, how, um, how our crisis makes way for crowns. We just thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 So 1 Samuel chapter 30, starting in verse 1, it says, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. All right, so David is the main character of the book of 1 Samuel. And we're first introduced to David in chapter 16 when the prophet Samuel comes to his house. The prophet Samuel is told that the king he's going to anoint is at uh, at Jesse's house. And so he goes to Jesse's house and David is the youngest son. Okay, he, is, he is the youngest of all of his brothers, and he is the least in his father's eyes, which is evidenced by the fact that he wasn't even invited to the cookout when the, when the prophet came over. Okay, his dad made him stay and continue to tend the sheep. And so Samuel gets there, and he sees all the sons. He's like, man, okay, he's not it. He's not it. God tells him, nope, 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 nope. And Samuel's like, bro, do you have any other sons? And Jesse's like, oh, yeah, I got, I got little David back in the back. He's like, well, go get him. And so he comes forward and God tells him, rise, anoint him. He's the next king. So David, as a young man, is identified as the next king. But it didn't happen overnight because from that moment that he gets anointed to the moment that the crown is put on his head is 15 years, 15 year process. And so David had to learn how to be a king before becoming one. He had to learn how to do that. See, everyone, everyone wants to be like David, right? Like, like we want to be chosen among thousands. We want to be anointed. We want to slay giants, right? right? We, we want to rule and reign, right? But the question to us is, are you willing to be the least amongst your brethren? Are, are, are you willing to do the jobs that no one else wants to do for very little recognition, are you willing to make music to the Lord in private? 
Are you willing to live like a king before you actually become one? See, uh, some of us want to be rich, but we're not willing to do what wealthy people do, right? Like you want to be a professional athlete, but you don't want to train, right? You want a committed relationship. You, you want a spouse, but you're not willing to walk in purity right now. Oh, I'm coming after your neck. Listen, you want to be promoted to management. You want to be a manager, but you're not managing yourself right here, right now. You won't lead from where you are. And so David, from the moment he gets anointed, we see that he's experiencing these highs and these lows. He's first called upon to make music in the palace for the king. And then he goes out and he slays a giant. And from slaying a giant, he becomes this hero. And, and everyone's beginning to know him. He's getting all this notoriety. They're starting to make songs about him. And these songs are like making the top 10 on the billboard and on iTunes, right? Like they're making songs about him. Now he becomes the, the king's son-in-law. He becomes best friends with the king's son. All this stuff is going well until the king begins to realize, oh man, this dude's a problem. Saul begins to get jealous and now Saul tries to kill him and David constantly has to evade all these attempts on his life by the king and so now he has to flee. And David becomes a fugitive and he's running and he's living in the mountains, he's living in the caves and finally he's like, man, I'm done. And he goes and he makes friends with the enemy. He's literally living with the Philistines and he makes this pact with the king called Achish, and, and Achish makes him and his mighty men this um, kind of a special ops, he and his mighty men. And so they're fighting wars for Achish, and, and Ziklag is a city that Achish gives David and his men to live in. And so as we are approaching Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, David finds himself in this really uh, precarious situation, all right? that the Philistines are about to fight against Saul and Jonathan and the army of Israel. And David's got to fight in this battle as well. Now, the problem with this is that if David opts out, then the Philistines know that he's not loyal to them, he's loyal to Israel, so they'll kill him. But if David opts in and he fights, he will never be king of Israel. And he very well may find himself fighting against Saul and killing Saul, that which he was very careful not to do. And so he's in this situation and they're having this planning meeting, all of the Philistine lords, and, and David walks up to this meeting. And as he walks up, the Philistine lords see him and they're like, hey, bro, 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 what is he doing here? We're not fighting with this dude. He, he's the one who killed Goliath. They, they make songs about what he did to us. Man, get him out of here. And so all of a sudden, David is dismissed from the fight. They don't want him to fight, and so they send David home. He has no war to fight, and so he and his men are sent home to Ziklag. Now, this is how life works sometimes, isn't it? Like, God gets you out of a jam, and you're relieved about it just to find yourself in another jam, okay? And so it was a three-day journey, 75 miles on foot, for David and his army of 600 men to get home. And just as they thought that they were headed home to rest and recover, that they, they, they thought that they were moving away from the fight, the fight was coming to them. See, sometimes God will deliver you from some battle so he can move you towards the ones he really wants you to fight. And had they not headed home, they could have never saved their families. And so they arrive at Ziklag and it has been completely torched. The Amalekites had stolen everyone and everything. All right, so what's a ziklag, okay? What does this mean to us? What's a ziklag? Ziklag is when bad things happen to you that you can't understand. Uh, ziklag, uh, ziklags are an attack of the enemy designed with you in mind. Satan is a real foe. He is our real enemy. He is not sovereign. He is not equal to God, yet he does have power and he does devise attacks against the children of God. And so Ziklags remind us that we are in a real war. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way. He said, there is no grosser or greater misrepresentation of the Christian message than that which depicts it as offering a life of ease with no battle and struggle at all. Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground not a playground. Ziklags never come at a good or convenient time. The enemy waits until we're vulnerable, right? We don't see them coming because we're focused in other places. 
The enemy designed Ziklags to take you beyond what you can bear and to take you out of the fight for good. Another thing about Ziklags is they often come through the open door of someone else's disobedience or, or bad choices. I mean, think about it this way. The, the, the whole... The, the very thing that disqualified Saul from being king and made way for David to become king, the, the nail in the coffin, was when God told, Samuel, or God told Saul to go utterly destroy the Amalekites. And guess who it is who came and took all their families away? The Amalekites. Ziglags are designed to dismantle our faith and unravel our confidence just before a breakthrough or a promise from God is fulfilled. And so the question we face in our time is not whether we're going to face zigzags as the children of God, because we will. The question is, will we endure in faith until we receive the promise, until our crisis becomes a crown? Will we do that? See, James 1 says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast in the trial. For when he has been proven, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And so the word ziklag, according to Bible dictionaries, means measure, press down. Measure, press down. Something you measure by pressing it or putting pressure on it. And so a ziklag experience comes into your life and it squeezes you and in it you find out who you really are. And I've said this for a really long time. You know, people are like tea bags. You put them in hot water to see what they're really made of. Okay. Now, this isn't all bad. And the reason why is because God is an expert at using these things to our benefit. He's an expert at using it to our benefit. How so? Because God often comes to us disguised as our life circumstances. Every time you suffer, every time you struggle, every time you're in in trial, it is an opportunity to discover new dimensions of God's character. And so this is what I want to say to you. And what I want to articulate is this point that the obstacle is the way. The obstacle is the way. So we look at obstacles in our lives and we think that these are things that keep us from our destiny. But I would submit to you that that your struggle, your trial, your suffering is not keeping you from your destiny. It's actually on the way to your destiny. It's on the way to it. I mean, many of our heroes have been through ziklags. They've been through ziklags. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, was unjustly thrown in prison. You got Daniel, who was kidnapped from his country, was exiled to Babylon, unjustly thrown in a lion's den. You got Paul, who was beaten and starved and stoned and shipwrecked uh, a couple of times on his way to writing a third of the, the New Testament. Uh, we have a, a marriage group that we do, uh, our family marriage, uh, marriage group, um, Acts 2 community that meets on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. Shameless plug. And one of the Tuesdays, we have what we call Testimony Tuesdays. And on that Tuesday, we have a couple come forward and they share their testimony. They share what God had done in their lives. And I'm going to just tell you, some of the most precious, uh, stable couples in our church uh, have lived through devastating miscarriages, uh, infertility, uh, you know, children with disabilities, um, addiction, pornography addictions, drug addiction. I mean, ziklags, ziklags. And they're some of the strongest and greatest couples I know. Think about Charles Spurgeon. You guys have heard of him. Charles Spurgeon, a little bit, okay? Known as the Prince of Preachers, all right? And uh, he was a 19th century British Baptist pastor, and he lived during the cholera pandemic, all right? So in the 1800s, millions of people around the world died, and it kept coming back in waves. And he was a 20-year-old pastor in London, and as the sick were dying everywhere, he was asked what he was going to do during this difficult time. And this is what he replied. You got to hear this. He said this. He said, fear to die? Thank God I do not have it. The cholera may come again next summer. I pray it doesn't, but if it does, it matters not to me. I will toil and visit the sick by day and by night until I drop. And if it takes me in sudden death, after sudden death is sudden glory. Christians, just can can I be honest for a second? We've had a really bad year and a half. We've had a a bad year and a half. 
I, I don't know where we lost the spirit that was in believers all throughout biblical history where, where we actually don't fear death because we actually believe in the resurrection. But we, but we have been some of the most fearful, petty, reactive, angry people. I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm right in your lap. I know that. But we've been that. We've been that. And so I'm not saying COVID doesn't matter. I'm not saying be reckless and go get it. But what I'm saying is you cannot scare me with heaven. You just can't. See, it's, there, there's a reason why the church in China is blowing up. Like there's a reason why the church in Afghanistan is growing like crazy. It's the same reason why the, the church in the book of Acts grew so well, because they understood what Joseph understood and what Daniel understood and what Paul understood and what Spurgeon understood. And you know what that was? They all understood that God will either deliver me from death or through death, but either way I get delivered. Yeah. One of my favorite uh, quotes of, of Spurgeon, he famously said this, I love it. He said, I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me up against the rock of ages. If I have to go through Ziklag, I'm going through. Amen? If I got to go through it, I'm going through it. No struggle, no story. No problems, no power. No crisis, no crown. The obstacle is the way. Everyone say Ziklag. I just blow it a kiss for me. Amen. <laughs> David and his men, they arrive at Ziklag to find it burned down. Everything they held dear had been taken away. But I want to show you three things as we wrap up here. Three things. I want you to see David's response, David's rescue mission, and David's reward. All right. David's response, David's rescue, rescue mission, and David's reward. Okay, first, David's response. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Another translation says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. All right, so they get back home. It's burned down. Everyone has been taken, and they're devastated. Now, this attack was internal for David. It was internal, it was external, and it was spiritual. All right, it was internal because it, was, it had impacted him personally. Right, that his own wives were taken. Right? But then it was external as well because he started to have all this friction with his mighty men who wanted to literally stone him. They wanted to kill him. They were that upset. But then it was also spiritual because none of the promises God had made to David reflected the circumstance that he was in. All right? And so what we have to do is important to contrast David's response with the response of his men because it says that they were thinking of stoning him. They, they were bitter because of their sons and daughters. And so David is learning something with many, which many of us have learned to this point is that you will either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain, right? <laughs> David became the scapegoat of all of this. And so in their zigzag moment, David's mighty men lost sight of their future and regressed back into their past, becoming again what they first were when they came to David. They were bitter in soul, it says. I, I want you guys to see this. 1 Samuel chapter 22. Look at these men before they, as they came to David initially. 1 Samuel 22 verse 2 says, And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. See, when, when David's mighty men first came to him, they were distressed, they were discontented, and they were in debt. So they were stressed out, they were mad, and they owed people money. And David took it upon himself to, to, to teach them the ways of Yahweh and to bring them along spiritually. But this moment, this ziglag was too much. 
It was too much. And so, you know, sometimes it takes a zigzag. Sometimes it takes a pandemic of pain for us to learn that many of us have been wearing masks long before COVID. The way, it should have hurt. I should have hurt. I should have hurt. The way you know that God has captured your heart is that you honor him when in pain and in prosperity. Right? The temptation is to get stuck on the injustice of the matter. And I get it. When zigzags happen, sometimes it's not your fault. But if you get stuck in the injustice, you can't get out of zigzag. All right. Now, as for David, it says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, that phrase translated literally means to fasten a grip. All right? He held on. It, it means to hold on to God, even when your circumstances tell you that he's left you. And so David responded to this crisis the way he had learned to respond in all circumstances, by turning to the God he knew. See, it's difficult in crisis to put into practice that which you have not established in peace. See, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is making you the type of person who can thrive in trial. He's making you someone who can respond well to suffering, but it's not going to happen overnight. And listen, God sometimes will show up when you're in trial and he'll give you a spiritual strength that you don't deserve in the moment, but you'll find out he does not always want to do it that way, right? And so being a person who responds well to trial happens in the daily walking with Jesus through minor trials and triumphs. And so the extreme pressure of the moment didn't change David's priorities. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Now you may be thinking, what does it look like practically to encourage yourself in the Lord? All right. What does it look like practically to do this? I believe you have to realign and remember. You have to realign and remember. Realignment is about perspective. It's about perspective. Um, I have to believe that when David came to a city and he saw it burned down, I have to believe that he just saw it and he said, man, I don't see anybody, but, but I also don't see any bodies. Are, are you getting that? See, if, if they had come and killed their, their wives and children, they would have left them there. They would not have carried dead weight. They wouldn't have done that. And so the fact that they weren't there meant that they were still alive. There was hope. There was hope for them. And so when you're in Ziklag, listen, like, I know you've lost something, but you have to recognize I've not lost everything. I've not lost everything. You never need, you never need God more than when you're suffering. Amen. Secondly, he remembered. It's about remembering. Remembering is about allowing your pain to remind you of your past and the future promises of God. One, one scholar called the Amalekites ancient enemies ancient enemies. David had to remember his past victories to get through his present trial. Why is that? Because your destiny is hidden in your history. Everything you've been through is preparation for what God's going to go do through you in the future. And hey, listen, I know you've been through some crap. Like I get it. You've been through some crap, but here's the beautiful thing about crap. Crap is actually great fertilizer. Yeah, it's great fertilizer. The very fact that you're living means God is not done. Listen, David could say this in that moment. David could say, whoa, whoa, wait, God, God, hold on. You saved me from the lion. You saved me from the bear. You saved me from the giant Goliath. You saved me from a jealous, insecure king. What is Ziklag to me? Your past struggles give you keys to future victories. And so David's response was that he grieved, he encouraged himself in the Lord, then he inquired of the Lord. Now again, contrast this. Contrast this with his mighty men, because in that moment, they became bitter and they blamed David, all right? But you can also contrast this with Saul, because at, at right about the same time, Saul is getting ready to go into a very ill-advised war with a crude up team of Philistine lords. And he can't hear the voice of God. And so you know what he does? 
he goes and he consults a medium. So this is what I want to say to you, is that when in Ziklag, you will either inquire of the Lord or you'll become bitter and blame other people or you'll go to mediums. Or, or shall I say, media ums. <laughs> David inquires of the Lord and he, and he asks, should I pursue them, right? Notice that David did not ask why. He said, God, what should I do? And this is how I know that David's a way better man than I am. Because I think had this happened to me, I would have already been on my way. I would have been ready to go, go Liam Neeson on these brothers, right? <laughs> I would have been, and, and then I would have been praying, asking God to bless my crazy, right? <laughs> but David, before doing anything, he goes to the Lord. And he says, what should I do? Should I go? And God said, go. You'll be successful. So that's David's response. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go over David's rescue mission. But if you uh, have access to our socials, if you are on Instagram, Facebook, um, and your partner with us on there, uh, look out this week. I'm gonna go over the second point. And it's a really important point because without the tests that David goes through, getting to this place to rescue, he would have never been able to do it. So he lives through the test of exhaustion and the test of an Egyptian. All right, so look out for that on socials, on the socials this week. So David's response, his rescue mission, and lastly, David's reward. Verse 16, he led David down and they were there scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. And none of them got away except 400 men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else. David brought everything back. He took the flocks and herds and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock saying, this is David's plunder. David gets to um, the countryside. He routes the Amalekites. And when it's all said and done, nothing is missing and everything is restored. And in the final analysis, David didn't just get his wives back. He didn't just get uh, the, his mighty men's families back. It said that, that he got everything that was stolen from everyone else as well. They ended with much more than they lost. They ended better off than they were had they never been through Ziklag in the first place. And that's not all. I sound like a salesman. That's not all. A few days later, a messenger would come to David and tell him that Saul has died. Again, it was a three-day three trip from Mount Gilboa to Ziklag, which means that at the very same time that David was watching his city burn, at the very same time while he was chasing his family and trying to bring them back, at the very same time as he was contending with his mighty men who wanted to kill him, at the very same time as he was dealing with his army wanting to quit on him, while he was fighting in this battle, a man was already on his way to tell him that he's gonna be king. Sometimes in the middle of our Ziklag experiences, God is already sending your blessing. He's already doing it, amen. Let's stand. You know, had David given up on God, had David quit on God during a crisis, he would have never gotten the crown. He would have never gotten the crown. Now, if you're here today and you have either gone through a ziklag or you're currently in a ziklag, let me just tell you where the power comes from to survive one. Because as great as David is, David's great. And he gives us a nice blueprint, but David's not the reason why we can survive Ziklag. The reason why we can survive Ziklag is because Jesus Christ is a greater David. He's a greater David who conquered a greater Ziklag. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he famously prays his prayer. He asks his father to take this cup of suffering. He did not want to go to the cross. And as Jesus is praying and asking his father to take this away, in his father's silence, you know what his response was? 
His father's response to him in that moment was, son, the obstacle is the way. The obstacle is the way. See, David went on a rescue mission for his people at the risk of his life, but Jesus went on a rescue mission for his people at the cost of his life. The cross was the ultimate zigzag. You either die a hero or you live long enough to become a villain, right? Well, on the cross and through the cross, Jesus became the villain and died a hero. He, he kissed the wave, as it were. Jesus was set ablaze and consumed by the wrath of God for our sins. And this devastating defeat, this crisis gave way to a crown when three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. You want to get through Ziklag, realize that the greatest Ziklag you could ever experience has already been conquered for you. And now you have the resources to get through it yourself. Amen. Amen. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. You're here today and you would say, Sean, I know exactly what that place is like. I know how it feels to be pressed. But I know how it feels to have everything burning up right in front of me. If you're here, you say, Sean, I need Jesus. I need God to show up and turn my crisis into a crown. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Hands all the way around. You know, I, I heard a, a definition of procrastination this week that was fascinating. Uh, and this de- definition of procrastinating is procrastination is the arrogance that God will allow you to do tomorrow what you should have done today. And so if you're here and you know you need to receive Jesus, you know you need to make a change, you know your life is blown, it's, it's, it's on fire all around you. You know that. Don't wait. Don't wait. Amen. You're a believer here today. You know what Ziklag feels like. But I sense that many of us see this and feel this. We're, we're coming out of, you know, a political season and coming out of, you know, who knows what's next as it pertains to this virus. But I think many of us sense there's this transition that's taking place. And the way you leave one season will determine how you enter the next one, Christian. But if you and I do not leave the previous season having repented of something or having tightened our relationship with Jesus, then you completely missed what last season was about. So if you're here today and you say, Sean, I want to repent. I want to give my life to Jesus afresh. I want him to be my guide. I don't want to get ahead of him. Raise your hand. I want to pray for you too. I see you. I see you too. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the people of God. I thank you for what you're doing all around the room, that there are people who are making decisions right here, right now, that they didn't even come here planning on doing. Hmm. Spirit of God, fill them full. And there are those of us, Lord, who maybe came in not even really understanding just how uh, deeply steep we were into the blame shifting or the bitterness or or to going to other sources. But Lord, today we inquire of you and we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for Ziklags. We thank you how you use them, Lord, for your glory, Lord God. Strengthen us today for the days ahead in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Amen. So we're gonna have our prayer team come forward. And so uh, children's ministry is dismissed. So if you have uh, children in children's ministry, please go get them, but feel free to come back. We want to have some time for, for prayer ministry. If you need prayer, please come down. We would love to partner with you. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming to The Rock today. Amen.